Hello, welcome to module two of our LPI certificate two. And in this video, we are going to focus on the topic Linux kernel. The LPI C2 exam it requires you to be able to not only understand what a Linux kernel is and what it's supposed to do, but you must also be able to compile a new kernel. Now, obviously, before we do see how to go through the processes requ required to compile a kernel, we clearly need to understand what it does. So the first question that may come to mind whenever you um, consider this topic, kernel or Linux kernel, the first question that may come to mind is, what is the Linux kernel? So here you see that according to Red Hat, the Linux kernel is the main component of a Linux operating system and is the core interface between a computer's hardware and its processes. So that is very self-explanatory and very important at the same time. Now, the Linux kernel does operate, does execute many, many tasks, but its uh, main, its core objective is to um, interface the uh, create an interface, a pipe of communication between hardware and the software and the processes. Um, it communicates between those two managing resources as efficiently as possible. So like I said, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's there in order to allow the software, the processes that are associated with the, the softwares that you are using with the hardware. And clearly, it does that by deploying many tasks. For example, we um, the, the, the kernel is responsible for, for example, determining whether a specific software can access a specific hardware, can send instructions to your uh, graphic card, for example, to your network interface card. Whatever the hardware is, we uh, the, the operating system is supposed to control how this software, how the processes are communicating, which means sending to or getting instructions from that specific hardware component. So basically, we can um, summarize what it does into these four topics or these four tasks. Memory management. So for example, it's the operating system that is responsible for performing memory allocation, for example. How much RAM a specific software is going to need in order to properly ex execute. Okay, so the operating system is going to uh, the, the, the kernel is going to analyze that and then allocate that specific amount of RAM for that specific software. This is a way of saving um, memory, RAM memory consumption, but at the same time preventing from one software to invade the space of RAM that is that's been allocated to another software. Uh, a very clear and known example of when this is not properly done is back in the day, um, specifically in Windows 95 or Windows 98, for example. It was very, very common to see what was called the blue screen of death. And the blue screen of death is a very good representation of an operating system that is not properly allocating RAM, not properly managing the RAM memory. Um, it's also responsible for managing processes. So, um, like I said, uh, when the kernel is managing the processes, it's controlling how the processes or the softwares are operating, how, um, what they're doing. Yeah, so, it also 
goes down to our last bullet here, system calls and security. So the, the processes are not directly accessing the hardware. They're requesting um, a communication via system calls to the kernel. And then the kernel is going to analyze whether that process can perform that task or not and how it should be done. Then the operating system, which is the kernel, is going to perform that task, which means access, communicate with the hardware, send instructions or receive data from that specific hardware component, and then send the response back to the software. The kernel is also responsible for loading the device drivers. It is the part, the kernel is the part that knows the device drivers. It can be, it can have built-in device drivers or it can load the device drivers as modules, which we're going to talk about. So, so there are these two options, but what matters for now is that the those piece of softwares that will teach the operating system how to access those hardware components, which are the device drivers, are loaded into the kernel. So the kernel must know the device drivers in order to communicate with the hardware components. And like I said, we also have the system calls and system security calls being performed by the operating system in order to prevent the direct, the direct communication between the processes or the software and the hardware. Now, another topic that you may see in your um, exam is kernel types. So basically, there are three types of kernels. A kernel can be monolithic, it can be a microkernel, or it can be a combination of the previous two. It can be a combination of a monolithic kernel and a microkernel. Now, what is the difference between those two? What is the difference between a monolithic kernel and a microkernel? The first one, a monolithic kernel, is a kernel where all the drivers are built in. So what that means is that all the software, all the piece of code that is required for a kernel to communicate with the hardware components, everything that is needed is built in in that kernel. So the kernel does not need any, any extra code. You don't need to install additional drivers, additional device drivers, for example, to be able to um, use a specific hardware component. So let's say that you just purchased a new um, network interface card. You plug that into the machine, you plug that in, in the motherboard, and if it's an operating system that uses the concept of a monolithic kernel, then ideally this kernel already knows the code that is required in order to communicate with that new network interface. Now, in a microkernel, it's exactly the opposite. The, the kernel has only the very basic instructions, the very basic line of codes in order to load that specific kernel. Then all the other device drivers, all the other instructions that will allow this kernel to communicate with the hardware components are loaded as external um, code. So basically you have a very small kernel and then a bunch of files that are being loaded as they are required. Now, the good thing about a, about a micro kernel is that, like I said, first of all, the, um, the basic kernel is very basic. It's very small. The drivers that are going to be loaded, they are external files and they will only be loaded when they are needed which is great. So you can save uh, 
RAM usage, you can save instructions, uh, the amount of instructions that are being loaded. On the other hand, there is an issue. And the, the, the problem there is, when you are loading these external modules, the operating system is going to process more instructions, which may cause the system to run a little bit slower than when compared to a monolithic kernel. Now, what that means is that a monolithic kernel is going to be large. It's going to be bigger than a micro kernel. So there is a trade off there. However, the biggest issue with a monolithic kernel, which is the type, the originally, this was the type of a kernel, a, a Linux kernel. Originally, a Linux kernel was a monolithic kernel. Now, as time passed by, with all the hardware components that started to appear, um, the options were and still are so vast. There are so many different components, different um, manufacturers, different modules, that it just became unfeasible to have a monolithic kernel if they were willing to maintain an operating system, a kernel um, that was supposed to be broadly adopted. So, what they did, and when I say they, I am basically um, talking about Linus Torvalds, which is the, the main the, the developer, the original def developer and the main maintainer. But obviously, he has a, an entire community be behind him. But when they intended to, to do this, time, this type of adjust, what they did was to combine a monolithic kernel with a micro kernel, which originated the hybrid kernel. Now, the hybrid kernel, which again, that's the current state of the Linux kernel, is you have a monolithic basic kernel with a bunch of modules that are built in that kernel. And then specifically for as far as the um, device drivers, they're mostly external modules or loadable modules, which gives you the hybrid kernel. Now, I mentioned that the kernel evolved for, from a monolithic to hybrid. And how does this evolution happen? Well, the, the, the Linux kernel evolved from its um, initial version, which was the version 1, and then it evolved to version 2, version 3, version 4, and we actually have version 5 nowadays. Although it's not listed here, but the, the, you can see that it's evolving. What you have to observe here is that there is a change of mindset, a change of concept between version 2 and the, 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 the newer versions, 3, 4, and 5. You can observe here that from version 1 to version 2, um, so basically Linus Torvalds decided to shift from version 1, uh, switch from version 1 to version 2, basically because of the time. Um, he noticed that Linux in its first version, version 1.x, 1. whatever, was an operating system trying to grow, trying to become accepted by the IT community. Then, when he realized that it was starting to get widely adopted, he decided to release the version. Uh, uh, he decided to release version two. Now, version two had a specific numbering. Its versions had a specific numbering. You had the first number here, 2, which is called the major version, and it's still called that. So you have the major version, then you had the minor version, then you had the release, and you may even see another 
number here, which was the patch version or the patch number. So basically, you would have the minor, uh, I'm sorry, the major version that would only change when a very um, important and something that, that would come, a change that would come to really change how the operating system would work more likely along with a change in architecture. So that means that basically this version here wouldn't change in a very long period of time. Now, the minor version would change when some significant changes were required, were made, but not as important as the major version. Then you have the release, which was basically a change um, of uh, a correction, a change, an update of a version according to bug fixes, for example. So let's say that you have version 2.2.0, the very first one in the 2.2 family. Okay, then they found a few bugs and they would release a new release. Now, you could also have, and you still have that, you could also have a patch version, which is not listed here because it's not important as far as the, the LPIC2 exam um, goes. But you could have a patch number here. So let's say you could have 2.2.5.20. That number would go along with the, um, the distribution, the Linux distribution. So you could have, for example, 2.2.5, okay? And then a distribution, Debian, for example, could release 2.2.5. whatever. Another distribution could release 2.2.5. a different number. So this was controlled by the, um, by the, the distribution. But what happened was that Linus Torvalds, he realized that this type of major change would hardly ha happen in such a way that it would justify the change from 2 to 3. So what he decided to do was, okay, if that's the case, there is no meaning in having this um, major version and minor ver version specifically if this is only going to change when um, quantic computers actually happen, which would justify the change of this um, version 2. So what he decided to do was to change the version, the major version, according to time. So now you have the major version and you have the release. And you can also have the patch number. So basically, these two numbers here became one. So version 3 would be something like 2.8, version 4 would be something like 2.10, for example. So it's just the way that the numbering is done now. From time to time, and um, so between this one and this one, it took seven years but it could take more, it could take less. Now, it's also important to understand that you may have noticed that you only, ha only have um, even numbers in the minor versions here. So 2.2, 2.4, 2.6. Oh, by the way, we also had the 2.0. So 2.0, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6. Where is 2.1, 2.3, 2.5? Well, those odd minor versions were development versions. So from 2.0, they started to work on 2.1, which was the development version, when they um, came to an agreement that 2.1 was a stable version, then they would release it but release it as 2.2, as an even number. Okay, when 2.2 was released, they started to work on 2.3, that was the development version, then when it became 
stable, they released 2.4. Now, what justified these changes? So, version 1 to version 2, specifically 2.0, was the symmetric multi support for symmetric multiprocessing or SMP architecture. Then from 2.0 to 2.2, support to other 64 bits architectures. From 2.2 to 2.4, we can see here um, a change in the, the modules to external, the physical modules in the motherboard to external um, hardware components such as ISA USB um, and also storage. So in kernel 2.4 where was when the Linux kernel started to support LVM and RAID. Then from 2.4 to 2.6, the file system started to support up to 16 terabytes um, and also some additional um, file systems such as BRTFS and many others. Then for the following versions, no significant change was required. It, again, it was just a matter of time. So from 2.6 to 3 to 4 to 5, it was, and it's still the policy nowadays. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of when um, the Linux kernel maintainers decide to change the major version. So these concepts regarding the Linux kernel are required so that you understand um, how the kernel actually works and how you can compile a kernel according to the LPIC2 exam. I hope you enjoyed this module, this video, and see you in our next video where we are going to learn how to compile a new kernel. Thank you. Hello, welcome to our second video of module two, Linux kernel. And in this video, we're going to see how we can compile a new kernel. So going back to the previous video, we discussed what a kernel is and what it's supposed to do. Now, with that in mind, understanding that the Linux kernel is the system, it's the, the software, that controls how the processes access the hardware, how the hardware, um, how the, the software is going to receive data from the hardware. Um, we can understand that the kernel is the software, it's the system software that actually communicates with the hardware. So given this low level communication, we are aware that it is this system that is responsible for loading the required um, code to allow the instructions, the execution of instructions to send data and receive data from the hardware. So that means that all these um, features are, can, they can be um, configured they can be adjusted. Now, how can you configure a kernel? How can you adjust a kernel? And that is done by performing a kernel, a new kernel compilation. So basically, you can determine how the kernel is going to operate. And in order to determine how the kernel is going to operate, you have to compile a new kernel. So just an example of a feature that you can determine in a new kernel is in the previous video, we talked about um, the monolithic and the micro kernel, the difference between these two. Well, and the, the main difference is built-in modules or external modules. And it's 
in the kernel, it's during uh, the kernel compilation that you can determine, determine whether a feature is going to be built in or loadable, externally loadable. And we are going to see how this can be done. So the, the first uh, uh, measure in order to compile a new kernel is to actually download that kernel. So the kernel.org website is the website that you can, uh, that you should access in order to download a kernel. Now, we're not going to uh, spend time discussing the, the kernel versions, but you can see here in the kernel.org website that you have a list of kernel versions here. Now, these are not the only versions that we have available, clearly. Um, if you want to see older versions than the ones that you actually have here, you can, for example, click here Obviously, it will depend on the protocol that you want to use during transmission when you're downloading the kernel. But let's say that you want to perform a HTTP download. You can go here, click on this link, then you're going to see Linux. You go to that Linux uh, link and you're going to see the subfolder here, kernel. And here you're going to see the kernel versions. So let's say... I can go to version 2.4 and there is a list of Linux kernels that you can download. So the kernel version that I downloaded for our demonstration, now I'm going to change here, and the kernel version that I downloaded is 4.4.272. So this one. Now, when you download a Linux kernel, you're going to see Linux, the file name is going to be uh, Linux dash the kernel version of that kernel that you are downloading. Dot tar. You may have a few different extensions here. Usually, you're going to see dot tar dot xz. Um, so the, 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 the XZ is the compression algorithm, TAR is because it was um, packaged using the TAR command. So this is a tarball. A tarball is similar to a bag full of files. So it doesn't compress, it just puts a bunch of files together into one bucket or one bag. And the XC is because we are using a zip compression algorithm here. The first step that you have to do, I mean, you can download this file, this star XZ file to anywhere. But in order to compile a new kernel, you have to copy it to the slash USR slash SRC directory. This is where you have to maintain this file. Because now what you should do is to extract this file using the tar-xvf and then the file name, like that. I am not going to do this because uh, I've already done it. What is going to happen when you do that is this, it will extract from that file, it will extract a directory with all the kernel files. So when you perform, when you execute this command, it is going to create this subfolder here, as you can see, and now I can enter that subfolder. And the kernel files are all in here. So keep that in mind. In order to compile a new kernel, you must enter the slash usr slash src directory. Now, if you want, and um, you should. Um, you can run before entering the uh, menu config tool, which we're going to see. You should perform a cleanup of the current directory. It is not about deleting files, it's performing a um, old files cleanup. In this situation, we have a kernel that we just extracted the files from that 
um, kernel file. So most likely there is no history in here. But let's say that you have a kernel that you compiled and then for some reason you need to compile that um, kernel once again with different option, options, with different features. You want to run make clean before running make menu config or any of the other uh, config commands that you want. Because by doing this, you you make sure that the previous kernel configuration is not going to impact in your current kernel compilation. So ideally, you want to run a make clean. Once the make clean is done, you can execute make config or make menu conf oops menu config or make x config make g config or make old config okay what is the difference between these ones personally i prefer make menu config the second option here first of all make config so all of them will do the same thing the goal is the same to allow you to select the features that you want in your kernel. Now, the interface that you're going to use is what will defer. If you run make config, you're going to um, see, basically see a file with all the options, the features as variables, the kernel features as variables. And then you have to be able to determine whether a specific feature is going to be um, enabled and how it's supposed to be enabled as an external module or as a built-in feature. Now, this is very rudimentary. I don't enjoy it. So I would, I would recommend you to use either make menu config, make x config or make g config. Okay, but make x config is it will present you a screen that will only work in case you are using the X window system. And this is a graphical interface. It's actually a graphical server. And considering that the Linux operating system is more focused on Linux uh, on servers, most likely you're not going to have graphical interfaces in servers, which means that you are not going to use this. Same thing for the gconfig. If you're using a GNOME graphical interface, you could use gconfig. But again, if it's a server, most likely there is no graphical interface, which means that there is no GNOME um, running. Therefore, I recommend using make menu config, and we're going to look at the that interface. The difference between menu config and old config is that old config is not going to ask you anything. It will simply use the previous configuration that you have saved in this directory. So it will use the previous kernel compilation that you've performed to create a new one, to compile a new one. Therefore, I recommend running make menu config like this. Now, observe that you may have to install a few packages before running make menu config, which is fine. Um, if you try to run make menu config and you don't have the library that, that is required to run it, it will tell you, hey, you don't have this file. You just have to figure out what package um, comes with that specific file or library or header. Okay, so basically this is what you have. Now, for example, if we, when we see this asterisk over here, that means that feature is going to be enabled and it's going to be enabled as a built-in feature. You can use the spacebar to disable. As you can see here, it's disabled now. If I hit the space bar again, it's as an asterisk again. Now, I have only the uh, disable or option for the 64-bit kernel, only disable or enable as a built-in features. I don't have the option of enabling it 
as a module. So you're going to see, you have to, I recommend that you go through um, the, the kernel features here. Um, so use the up and arrow, uh, up and down arrows and navigate, browse through the options that you have here. Oops. So browse through the options that you have here. When you see in a menu like this, networking support, and you see this arrow to the right, that means that you have more options underneath that option. So you can simply hit enter, and then you're going to see the other options. Now, in networking support is where you can determine um, things such as the type of technology that you, you want enabled as far as your network functionalities. Now, what is important here is, now observe that the CAN bus subsystem support is checked, is enabled, but it's not as an asterisk as you can see for wireless. It's as M, which stands for module. So now I can hit the space bar here and switch between disable, as you can see. I can hit it again and enable it as module, external module. And again, if I want it built into my kernel. So just to recap, just to remember the difference, the difference between M external module is that this feature is going to be enabled but as an external file so the kernel is loaded and only if that feature is required it will be loaded the file will be loaded into the ram if it's compiled as a as asterisk that means that it will be built into the kernel whenever the kernel is loaded which is during the booting process this feature will be um, loaded as well because it is in the kernel. So you have to navigate, have to browse and look for the features that you want. When you are done, you can exit, you can exit. It will ask whether you want to save the changes that you've made or not. And you can enter, you can hit yes to save those options. I am not going to do that because I did it in the past. Okay, so now when I have that done, observe that it will create a .config file here. This .config file is the file that stores the options, the features that I enabled or disabled in my kernel. So the kernel compilation, the new kernel, will be compiled with features, features based on this .config file over here. Now, observe that I did not compile the kernel. I simply determined which features I want enabled and which ones I want disabled. And out of those that I want to enable, which ones I want to enable as built-in or external module, loadable modules. Okay, once that's done, I can run the make busy image. Well, make busy image is the command that will actually um, compile the kernel, the new kernel. Busy, that's because I want to create this image, this kernel, um, compressed as uh, using the bzip compressor, using the bzip algorithm. Obviously, I don't want my kernel to be too large, so I want to compress it. So make busy image. Once you run, observe that busy are lowercase, i is uppercase, and mage, m-a-g-e, are lowercase. It's, it must be that way. It will compile the kernel, and once it's done, you are going to see you are going to see the vm linux file in this directory the vm linux file is the kernel itself that is the kernel file so basically the entire kernel file according to the features that i enabled will will generate a 30 meg file 
So as you can see, a Linux kernel is not too large. Again, unless you compile almost everything as built-in uh, modules, not as external modules. Okay, but you are going to compile a few features as external modules. Actually, there are some features that ca they can only be enabled as external modules, as loadable modules. You cannot put everything inside the kernel. In uh, modern Linux kernels, you cannot have an entirely monolithic kernel. Which means that, okay, we created the, the kernel, we compiled the kernel, but what about the modules? How can I compile and install the modules? Well, for that, you're first going to run make modules, which will compile the kernel module files. Not the kernel, not the kernel, but the kernel module files, the loadable files. However, these modules, when they are compiled by make modules, they're going to be stored in the current directory. I actually have to store those files, the Linux kernel. Uh, module files must be stored in slash lib slash modules slash and then you're going to have your kernel module version in here. There you go. Now, this only exists because I already executed the make modules install um, command once. If I hadn't executed the, the next command, which is make space modules underline install, this directory would not exist. What you have to keep in mind is that the, uh, the modules, the loadable modules must be installed, stored in a slash lib slash modules, and it will create a subdirectory there with the same name of your of the, uh, the kernel version that you are compiling. So, you compile the modules by using make modules. Once that's done, you run make modules under core install, and this is what will create the slash, in this case, slash lib slash modules slash 4.4.272 directory. If we take a look at that directory, oops, lib modules. If we take a look at it, we're going to see a subdirectory called kernel. And here you're going to see the drivers, the, the loadable modules. So you have the drivers in there. You have network modules that will allow your network to work. So, for example, um, to use VLAN, you have the 8021Q directory with the modules in there. Um, IPv4 are in here, IPv6 are in here. So, all the network modules that you use are going to be in this directory. Okay, so now we do have the, uh, the kernel, we do have the Linux kernel, and we do have the kernel modules or the loadable modules. However, how can I use this new kernel? I know that I'm using a kernel. In this case, I am using 3.10.0. Well, that's not the idea. That's not the kernel that I want to use. I want to use the one that I just compiled, which is 4.4.272. Well, to do that, I have to tell my machine how it, it should load the new kernel once my machine is restarted, is rebooted. Okay, so by now, you should know that when you have a Linux uh, operating system installed in your machine, most likely, most likely, before loading the operating system, the Linux operating system, it will load a, um, a, a loader, a operating system loader. For Linux, the most known bootloaders 
are Lilo and Grub. Currently, it's very difficult to see a Lilo or a Lilo, if you prefer, bootloader nowadays. Most likely, you'll be using Grub, whether it's Grub version 1 or version 2. So, you have to configure that bootloader and tell it, hey, bootloader, hey, Grub, I have a new kernel and I want you to allow me to select that new kernel um, when you reboot, when you load. Or you can even tell Grub that this new kernel is supposed to be the default kernel when it's rebooting. Therefore, you have to configure Grub. But Grub will have a few, will follow a few patterns, a few standards. To start with, the slash boot directory is the direct, let me clear the screen here. Oops. The slash boot directory is the directory that is supposed to store kernel files. Not only kernel files, but the files that are required to load the new kernel. As you can see here, and let me, yeah, so all the files are here. So as you can see, I have the config file here, but, but that's for the my current kernel, not the new one, which is not important. I can start here, but it's not important. What is, what is important here are the init RAM disk, RD stands for RAM disk, or you can also call it RAM file system, RAM FS. Um, you also need the system map file and you need the kernel, which is the VM Linux. In this case, so I copied the VM Linux file to here as VM Linux with a Z dash the kernel version. Now, along with my kernel, I need the system map file dash the version. So these files are actually here. Here's the system map, here's the VM Linux, and here's the init RAM disk file. I just have to make sure that I copy these files, one, two, three, to the slash boot directory with the dash kernel version extension. So init rd-44272, system map 44272, and vmlinus-44272. Now, you know by now that the vmlinus file is the kernel. However, first of all, there are some functions that the, the kernel file will load but won't be able to access. It won't know how to load a few system calls. System calls and how to access those calls uh, in the, the RAM will be mapped by the system.map dash kernel version file. So this file will tell the kernel, hey kernel, if you want to access a specific function, this is in the RAM, this is where it's stored. Now, additionally, you also need the init RAM disk or the init RAM file system. What it, it does is, again, you know by now that although a bunch of features can be built into the kernel, not all features can. And there are situations where you don't even want um, very important features to be built inside the kernel. You want them as external modules. However, there are some external uh, there are some features that are required for the kernel to load, for the system to boot, to load. Now imagine the, the following situation. Let's say that you formatted your uh, the, the partition in which the Linux kernel, in which the Linux system is installed, you formatted that partition as, let's say, ext4. That's the file system that you used, that you implemented into the that partition. However, the ext4 
um, file system support was compiled as an external module, not built into the kernel. So observe that when you reboot your system, and it's going to so the so then grub is shown and it shows you the kernel versions that you have. And you want to load the new kernel that you just compiled. Okay, so you select that option. What Grub is going to do is it will load the VM Linux file. Now, while the VM Linux, while the kernel is being loaded, the kernel will need to, um, and it knows that there are some features that are uh, that were installed as modules, external modules. Well, if it's an external module, the file that will teach the kernel how to operate, that will teach that feature to the kernel, will be stored in the hard drive as a file, which means that the kernel has to be able to access that partition in which the file is stored. Now, in this scenario, if the ext4 file system was compiled, file system support, was compiled as a module, which means that it's stored as a file in the, hard, in the partition. How is the kernel going to load that module that is stored in the hard drive if the kernel doesn't know that file system, if the kernel doesn't know ext4 file system? So there is a loop there. The kernel needs to load a file that is in the partition, but the partition cannot be accessed because the kernel don't know that file, doesn't know that feature. So in order to fix that problem, we create the initial RAM disk file. It's a file that will be complementary to the kernel. If there is any module, external module, or any feature that was compiled and installed as an external module, and it's important for the kernel during the booting process. The kernel, before trying to access the, the hard drive, it will load the initial RAM disk file. So then those modules will be loaded along with the kernel to allow the kernel to know all those features, all those critical, very important features before finishing loading the system entirely. Okay, now that we have all those files there, we can configure grub. The grub configuration file is in the slash boot slash grub. Well, then it will depend on the version of your distribution. But in the CentOS 7 distribution, it's slash boot slash group 2. And here you're going to see the grub.cfg file. Yes, you can edit this file. You can, but you shouldn't. That is why there are so many, so many tools available to help you with it, to help you update your grub. And I would recommend using the grub to, if you enter grub2 dash and hit the tab key twice, you're going to see all the grub uh, tools, grub2 tools here. And the grub2 mk config tool is the one that will search for the files, the kernel files that you have in the slash boot directory, and it will create a new file based on that. So basically you can run grub to mkconfig and as you can see here you're going to use the dash o option o as in output to determine where the, the detected configuration should be outputted to should be saved to so this will create the test.cfg file because i created it just as a test but ideally what you want to do is to run slash boot slash group two slash group dot cfg there you go or you can edit the grub dot cfg file 
as well. Although, once again, I do not recommend it. So, once it's done, you can simply reboot your machine and Grub will list this new kernel. You select that new kernel, boot, boot in that new kernel, and you, have, you should have your new kernel running. In order to confirm whether it's working or not, whether it compiled a new kernel or not, you can run the uname command or simply uname-r. That's not, I'm not running the, the, the new kernel, but this is what you could do. So I hope you enjoyed this video. In our next video, we're going to see some very important um, commands that we should use and we should be, be aware of for the LPI C2 exam, but also because you want to know these commands in order to deal with kernel modules, loadable modules, external modules. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome to module two, video three. And here we're going to see some commands that are very important whenever we're dealing with kernel modules or external modules or loadable modules. We have to be able to load and unload modules. We have to be able to see what external modules are currently loaded and how I can load or unload those modules if necessary. So the first command that you, ha you have to know is the ls mod, list modules, short for list modules. This will show you all the modules that are currently loaded. So, and again, these are external modules. So you can see that all these modules here are listed edd sgst so there is a list of those modules right there one thing that is important to observe here is the third column used by we can see here that for example the raid 6 underscore pq module is used by the btrfs module that means that in order for the BTRFS module to work, the RAID 6 PQ module must also um, be loaded, must also exist. It also means that if I remove or if I unload the RAID 6 PQ module, the BTRFS module will be unloaded as well so this is very important and why is this so important well for a couple of reasons first first of all if you want to use or if you need to uh, um, if you want or if you need to use this module you need this one as well so there is a dependency there and also because you have to be aware that if you unload this feature this other feature will be unloaded as well. And this is also important in order to understand the difference between the ins mod command and the mod probe command, the difference between these two. There are also a couple of differences, but this is one of those. The ins mod, which stands for insert module, um, is the command that you can use to load a module. So, for example, let's say that I do insmod 8.8021q. Uh, okay, it doesn't exist, but let's say that I did have this module here. When I use the insmod, oh, also because I didn't specify the path, so obviously this is not going to work. Um, and I don't uh, recollect the full path, but the first difference is uh, 
when you use the insmod command, you have to know the full path to that module. We know that that all kernel modules are stored in slash lib slash modules slash to and obviously you have the kernel version here two dot uh, no four dot four dot two seventy two and in here I will have net oh I'm sorry uh, I will have kernel net and 8021q here okay so that's a problem package not installed but this is how you'd use the insmod um, command you have to specify the full path to that module when you use the mod probe um, command you do not have to do that as you can see here now if i do ls mod i can see that this module is loaded here somewhere probably up there there it is now both of them are going to do the same um, again if we use the insmod command and if there is a dependency, you have you have which was the case, you have to load the insmod uh, command for the the parent module first, and then you have you're gonna have to to load to load the one that you want. If you want if you use mod probe, mod probe will know all the dependencies required to load that specific module. It will load. The, the the dependencies and then the module that you want same thing for unloading a module if you want to unload a module using the which which is the pair of the insmod command that's the rm mod you can however you can also use mod probe dash r to remove that module and if there is a dependency that dependency will be um, will be unloaded as well so most of the times the difference lies mostly on loading the module not so much on unloading now if you want to gather some information uh, about a module you can use the mod info um, command so here for example if I run mod info and then the module name it will go for the slash lib slash modules slab the kernel slash the kernel version that you're using the current your current version and it will load uh gather information about the that module in there so you can gather some information about it it's very important to observe that the dependencies are also listed here now the lpic2 exam also requires you to understand the goal of each directory now as far as kernel and modules go the main directories that we have are the slash boot the slash proc and the slash lib directories clearly by now you know what the slash boot directory is for and also the slash lib so slash boot that's where we store the kernel or kernels and the init rd files and the system map files also the uh, bootloader configuration such as the grub bootloader configuration you also know that in the slash lib directory that's where you, you store the modules but what about the proc directory so the proc directory which stands for processes you are not going to only have information about about the 
running processes that as well but not only that you also have information about your uh, system and hardware specifically information about the hardware gathered and monitored by your operating system so for example we have the slash proc slash cpu info info file you can see information about your cpu in that file so there you go that's the vendor that there is the the uh the model um the processing capacity so information about your how many cores it has information about your cpu same thing for your ram memory you have the slash prox slash meminfo file so that's your the total amount of ram that you have how much is free how much is uh, available how much is buffered how much is cached if you're using swap so all those types of information so what can you see in this slash proc directory this is what is important about this directory is that this is not a physical directory let's say these files they are not stored in your storage device they are not in the hardware they're up uh, they are not in the hard disk they are not in the partition these are temporary fi files virtual files created in the ram to gather information about your system and how your system is managing the the hardware the lpic2 exam also expects you to understand a few additional um commands that are use, useful when dealing with hardware and modules so for example we saw the uname command but you also have the ls pci and depending on the distribution you may have to install the ls pci package so the ls pci will list the pci hardware components that you have so for example my ethernet controller my network interface card is listed here same thing for my audio device if you have usb devices you can list those devices by using the ls usb okay so there there you go there you have it another command that you have to be aware and it's actually very useful is the dmask command the dmask command is basically a log of the booting process it's most likely the most low level command that you have in the linux system as far as tracking down what your system has and what your system um, detected during the during the booting process so for example all those messages that you see when you're loading your linux system they are also going to be listed here and you can can go back to it at any time by simply running the dmask command there you go now even after booting your system you can track down what is going on as far as your uh, your system and hardware components go because you can filter the result the output of the dmask command for example um i want to see if my linux system detected any network interface okay so i can do dmask pipe grep let's say ethernet prob because i know that my network interface card is an inter ethernet interface okay but it seemed like it didn't detect anything what if i try grep dash i which stands for none case sensitive well no so it didn't detect it as ethernet but maybe as network okay so it did find something with the network um keyword there but not as network interface what about adapter let's see if no so 
it didn't detect it as a depter, but I can perform this kind of, so, uh, of, uh, of filter. What about my storage device? Maybe it's called SDA. I don't know if, if it, let's see, DF uh, VDA. So let me do VDA here. Okay, so let me clear the screen here. My partitions and my hard drive is detected, is named VDA. So I filter for VDA to see if it detected my hard drive and my partitions. And, oh, okay, so VDA, um, so it detected my hard drive here. It's a 20 gig hard drive. Um, there are two partitions, so the VDA hard drive is split, divided, segmented into two partitions. Um, one is the swap partition and one, the other one is the X4 file system. That's where my, file, my root partition was mounted on. So that's what I can do with the DMAS command. I can track down how my operating system is interacting with the hardware. And similarly, there are some internal kernel options that, that can be loaded and unloaded at any moment. Um, you can either edit the slash etc slash the sysctl.conf file or its subdirectories sysctl.d and then you're going to have the files there or you can use directly use the sysctl command to load or unload the options that you need. Obviously, you have to know the variables. So, one example is the, um, in order to allow a Linux kernel system, a Linux system to forward packages so that you can use it as a router, you have to enable IP forwarding. Now, in order to enable IP forwarding, you, can, you should use the cctl command, but you have to know the name that is defined for that specific features. And then you can use the cctl, the variable, IP underscore forwarding equals 1. This will enable IP forwarding. And again... You can also edit the slash etc slash cctl.conf or one of the subdirectories of uh, one of the files in the subdirectory in this slash etc slash cctl.d subdirectory. So these are some tools that are very important for your um, LPIC2 exam. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Please. Once again, go through the main page of these commands, uh, practice these commands a little bit more so that you get ready, pre prepared for the exam. Thank you very much.